everybody. Welcome to Psych Talk, episode 544. Uh, recording today live Wednesday, the 8th of August 2018. want to welcome all our people in the uh, YouTube chat. Uh, if you want to join us there, uh, youtube.com forward slash Sonic State forward slash live will get you there. And in the IRC, if you just do sonicstate.com forward slash live, you'll be able to get to the chat room there. We've got two chat rooms. I try and keep an eye on both of them, but it's not always that straightforward. So we'll do our best. Uh, uh, when we get to that. Um, I should probably just really quickly, I've got to uh, join that one. Okay, I've got to get my YouTube chat in my uh, in my my stream. Anyway, uh, we're a podcast to do with music technology, believe it or not, not bumbling fools trying to webcast. It's actually uh, music technology, synthesis, synthesizers, uh, software, controllers, iOS stuff, modular synths, analog synths, digital synths, anything to do with electronic music production or music production or live performance, any of those things, it's fair game. We'll be talking for that about the next hour and we'll have a competition where you could win, a ch you get a chance to win Isotopes Vocal Synth 2, excellent vocal processing suite of plugins, uh, which we will tell you a bit more about later on. So uh, let's say hello to everybody. Who have we got here? Well, we'll start with you, Rich, because we haven't seen you for a while. You've been on the road, as it were. Um, you where in the world are you? I'm guessing the same time zone as if I didn't know. Yes, I am. I'm in uh, a place called <laughs> Brooklands, a place called Brooklands, which is near Surrey, which uh, is very nice. Yeah. And we're playing, uh, the next two days we're playing at race courses. Really? Um, and one of, them, one of them is apparently near here. The Chic Race <clears throat> Course Tour. That sounds like an interesting Yeah, brief. Idea. However brief, yes, we're going to go... Uh, Wake up and smell the roses. As they Does that say. mean you've got to uh, run? Have you have you got to go? I mean, you start the gig in a set of stalls, and they sort of have to pull the lever down. You run, you run to your, <laughs> run to your run instrument. To the stage. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because right outside of this hotel is a is a an automobile racing track uh, from this place called Brooklands that is apparently closed uh, for racing. But there's a huge Mercedes building right here, and there's cars ripping up and down this thing, and uh, it's all wow. very exciting. So you might get the chance <laughs> to do something, uh, something perhaps that would be uh, uh, in a car. Well, anyway, Rich, thank you very much. Well, for a couple of the guys actually, yeah. a couple of the guys actually went over to see if they could uh, arrange something like that. Yes, a zip round the track in a very expensive motor car. That, that'd be a lot of fun. Well, lovely to have you, Rich, and I uh, hope you're enjoying your tour here and your stay in the UK as ever. The weather. Uh, we've oh, yeah. toned it down a little bit for you the next few days. It's not going to be quite so hot, so you should be, uh, you know, you might need a jumper. <laughs> None of this was terribly hot to us. Yeah. It's I much suppose. hotter at home. I much bet it hotter is. at home. Okay, well, thanks for joining us. Anyway, let's get over. Well, we haven't had him for a while. Either. We've got DivKid, a.k.a. Well, Ben Wilson, a.k.a. DivKid. It's for the white right way around. I'm sure you weren't christened DivKid, were you? So it's probably, yeah. <laughs> uh... So um, how are no, you? No, Christen... I'm good, yeah. Chris and Ben and not Benjamin, which no one ever believes either. When I'm filling out forms and they go, will you put your full name, please? And I'm like, it's just Ben. My mum must have thought I wouldn't be able to spell my name, so it really is just Ben. Well, but, could um, be. <laughs> yeah. Could be Benedict. But yeah, I'm good. Yeah, could be. Um, but yeah, I'm well. Um, never mind heat that Rich isn't bothered by. I've been absolutely dying under video lights, making demos lately. Way too hot. Well, I see you've so, got a yeah. very fine collection of uh, modular stuff there. So, uh, yeah, I mean, imagine, do you, do you, yeah, have you got to the one. point now where you switch it off if you don't need it so it's not generating the heat? Um, I've always switched it off, actually. I've had lots, I know lots of people leave them on. I, very, I do turn it on and off, but I, I hit record before I turn this. They're on a different set of plugs, so I get the machine recording at a safe-ish level before I do anything. Hit record, machine goes on turn it off um, and I can pull between about eight and 12 stems out with my output system and my sound card and things. So I never miss anything, but I do always turn it off. I see. And uh, what's, uh, what's been happening in the world of uh, DivKid recently? I know you've, you've been posting a few videos. So uh, what have you got? What you, yeah. get, you get allowed to plug that. That's only fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, a few bits. The Endorphins Grand Terminal, which isn't a new thing. Um, but it, it's their kind of take on a surge dual slope generator. So there's two envelopes that can also loop or be oscillators, kind of multifunction 
rise and fall, whether that's audio or LFOs or anything else. Um, two filters that are based on um, Urs Heckman's DSP development, the zero delay filter thing that we see in like the UHE Diva. Um, I think it's the only bit of hardware doing that actually, kind of virtual analog filters to that level of DSP processing. Right. Um, sound really amazing. Um, they just sound like all the analog filters I've got. There's no less mojo for, you know, the the um, four-pole low-pass or any of the others. They sound like analog filters, um, which really makes me interested to go and check out Diva because I haven't played it for a long time. And I think it's in Reactor now as well. I think all the Reactor blocks use that technology. And that's um, so yeah, his own, own, own design. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, I think the DSP must be open source because Endorphins openly say this is the new DSP development that they've ported in to a module. Um, and then today I just released a video of the Filter 8, which more filters, but um, Geranalog, Belgium company, um, say it's the cutting edge of analog filter design, which is a bit maybe clickbaity. I did put that in the title of the video, but Why ever not? it yeah. does more than any other filter that i've ever tried um it'll do like multi-phase outputs it's an eight phase lfo oscillator slew limiter um you can get and create gorgeous kind of 808 uh, very apt for the day 808 type kicks and schwerman like percussive little things yeah really impressive so a couple of modules on my channel recently that have really kind of taken me back a bit that are quite different i think yeah, excellent. Well, I, I can't, I mean, you know, I, I moan about having too much to do here, but I mean, the amount of modules there are to review compared to sort of synthesizers and, you know, ancillary equipment is, you know, is exponentially larger. So, you know, good on you. Keep it up. Keep it up, Ben. Yeah, <laughs> and we've also got <laughs> Mr. Matthew Hodson, uh, who is MatthewHodson.com, Matthew Hodson Music. Uh, we've had him a while. He's now, he, we had him on for the last few weeks because he's he's the consistently available guy because he's now, <laughs> the, the, the term is over and he is an educator as one of the other things that he does. Also an artist, producer, uh, library music guy, music, comp composed to music, etc. But now term's over. You've got a bit more time on your hands to get on with your EP. And you've been doing a lot of web streaming as well, have you, Matt? Oh, yeah, actually, um, as well as watching all of Ben's videos, I've been doing some of my own recently and dabbling in that world. Um, while I'm writing my EP here, I've just been doing some live streams. Every now and then I've just been stopping, talking about the patches that I've created, how I'm making them, how I'm building sounds up. Um, and then sometimes I'm just doing live jams, showing stuff that I'm doing at the time. And it just allows people to just um, get in contact and ask me questions about how I'm using the stuff behind me, the Eurorack stuff, as well as outboard equipment, and just get involved with the process a little bit. And yeah. um, it's good, actually. They give me some inspiration, too, and a few ideas about, you know, why don't you plug this into there and plug that. So, uh, yeah, I try out some new stuff. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I guess also, you know, it's no harm in getting new fans, and when you finish the EP, you can sell them a copy. That's also uh, a positive from that sort of thing as well. well hopefully, yeah, well, anyway. it it's good fun doing the YouTube stuff. I've never really done it before. And um, Instagram is my main thing. I'm usually on there quite a lot. I've got, that's where mainly people hang out with me and I post stuff, but YouTube's good. And now I've got like a multi-camera set up in here and a decent enough connection. I can, I can stream pretty easily. I just flick on the cameras and, and away we go. It's, it's pretty, pretty straightforward really, but yeah, I'm enjoying it. It's great. You're doing a stream after the show as well. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm nudging you in the direction of plugging your next live stream ah. as well. I put it in the show notes too. So, oh, did you? Oh, thanks yeah. so much. Yeah, after this, um, yeah, after this, I thought I'd just do a live jam. So, if anyone's finishing their cup of tea after we finish talking, head over to my YouTube page, or I'll uh, Nick's put a nice link in the in the description of this video. Just head over there, and I'm just going to do a, a live jam with my kit behind me so I excellent would. excellent well look forward to that um okay so let's uh, let's get all this 808 day of course today and you know there's always hey. speculation about whether or not uh, roland would usually uh, um, go get the uh, 808 day and uh, release some stuff i haven't seen anything yet maybe there's something's happened since i started the show but i know that uh, uh, uh behringer posted one of their rd08 sort of jams uh, which was literally just before the show, so I haven't had a chance to put that in, but, you know, that's their analogue thing. We've talked about that in the past, so that's obviously... Don't forget about us. We're still here in the only way that Behringer ever do, so uh, that's that's their thing. And um, 
And they did sort of tease us, say, see you on the 9th of the 9th. So I guess that might mean that they're teasing, pre-teasing a 909, but who knows? Let's, uh, let's leave it at that. Let's get on to a topic. What about this? This is a plug-in from a chap called, now if I'm going to pronounce this correctly, Neboja, Neboja Petrovic. It's called Ribbon. And it's just basically some ribbon controllers and iOS, but they all loop, so you can hey guys, kind of so set up these modulations. So in the last I've been anyway. working on this iOS MIDI controller I'll app called Ribbon, and I'm excited to finally share it with you guys. So here it is running on both iPhone and iPad. So it's a universal app. You get it once, and you have it for both platforms. And in a nutshell, it gives you eight different ribbon touch controllers that you can control your hardware synths or effects with that are all MIDI enabled. And for each one, you can assign a unique MIDI channel and MIDI CC number. So effectively, for example, you can have a filter cutoff on one of the ribbons, resonance on the other, a delay control, anything that you can control with MIDI on your hardware devices, you can control with a ribbon here. So effectively, by default, every ribbon starts recording and looping your motion with your fingers. So for example, if I go here, I go left and right, wiggle a little bit, and you can see it starts repeating that motion. And obviously you can do the same for the others, and it's multi-touch, so you can record and loop at the same time for all that's essentially the nub of it and i think it's a genius idea it's 99 cents and mm. what's really smart about this is, i mean because i've been i've been sort of uh, uh advocating the idea of putting kind of uh software lfos and envelope generators in midi controllers so you can assign a midi controller to an lfo value and have it just spit out and, and generate a, a modulation of that cc controller this effectively allows you to do that but it, but obviously not non-traditional shapes i mean you'd have to draw them in to get the kind of thing but you can draw a path across it and just have it out there and what's he goes on later in the video and plays you know like a volker keys or something and just modulates all this stuff and he's just playing a really simple sequence and suddenly it's massively complicated and really quite interesting and i thought what a bloody great idea. And I know, I don't know who wants to go first on this. I, I'm going to go to you, Rich, first, because I know, you know, you've obviously you've discovered the expression of the, the Roly stuff, but there's always been this sort of disconnect, haven't there, between um, between the visceral of the MIDI controller, which is just the knob or a fader, and the idea that this can be recorded just seems like such a, a genius, simple idea. It does. And I love this thing. I was really impressed. As I, I unfortunately didn't get to prepare well for the show, but watching what you've just shown me uh, makes me very interested in it, and it seems like a really, really cool thing. That said, why not make a lane available to become an LFO or, um, or a drawable um, event rather than a performable event and why not allow it to look like an envelope if you so desire it to look like a looping envelope so it's, it's great it's fantastic i love it for 99 cents it's a bargain for 10 times that but um why not allow uh yeah. wave shapes into the game it's interesting he did he, at the end of it he said you know i started developing this app a while ago and i put all these bells and whistles and extra functions in and in the end i decided it was much more straightforward just to do really simple i mean okay. I'd, like to see, I'd like to see a couple of, you know it'd be nice if you could just name each lane so there was a word in it that said what it was doing and yeah. maybe loop toggle the loop function on or off per lane so that you had some looped and some didn't rather than all on or all off which is the way that it is at the moment but okay. i take your point rich but i think he wanted to just make it simple and it's great it's great for what it is and i really am impressed yeah absolutely um ben i i, I know you i don't know whether you you, you know, i mean you inevitably use some controller stuff but working a lot in modular i guess you know a lot of these things you can do in some module to some degree although it's not maybe as immediate <clears throat> i mean let's hook this up to something which had maybe a uh, uh, uh a cv converter like maybe you could hook it up to yeah. uh, expert sleepers fh1 or something like that that would be pretty cool right yeah, definitely. The the thing it does well, it, it's ninety nine p or cents, so it's it's a total no brainer. Um, the things that Rich mentioned uh, are in a program called Parrot Plus that will be all oh. sorts of other things, but I think that's probably quite a bit more money. Well, you know, it'd be ten pounds, which isn't a lot of money, but more than ninety nine pence. Um, but yeah, you could hook it up, and the thing it does that's you know the great thing about joysticks or pressure controllers. If you kind of think, I want this to rise up really quickly, come back down, and then very slowly rise again, you just do it, and it just loops. You know, it, it's gestural, and it will just do what you want, rather than trying to think, right, well, if I get two LFOs, and then I mix them, but I offset them in a weird way, yeah, yeah. Kind of, <laughs> it, it takes all that rubbish out of the equation, which 
people love getting lost in, but I don't want to spend 30 minutes patching up the kind of expression that I want when these sorts of things, be it a joystick or an iPad app, will do it. Um, it looks great. It looks much simpler to use than some of the more complex apps, but at the expense of it being simple. But like we said, it's under a pound, so we can't complain. Yeah, absolutely. I suppose the thing is, you know, I, I don't think there's any kind of issue with tempo sync. It's all free running recorders. So, I mean, I guess if there was a master yeah. clock, that sort of thing, you know, but again, it would get much more complicated and you have to do different takes. Whereas this, you just tap it to clear it and have another go. Yeah, Matt. Yeah. What do you reckon? Yes. Interesting one. I mean, for 99p, bargain. Someone just said in the chat room, though, but you still need a thousand pound phone to run it on. But <laughs> so I thought that was quite funny. Well, or a 300 buck uh, iPad. <laughs> yeah, fine um yeah i really like this uh user interface is always important to me and it's so intuitive isn't it um using all the fingers i like the color scheme reminds me of my favorite pair of socks and um yeah i can just imagine myself using this and plugging it in and and kicking out some of the modules i couldn't quite make out though does it actually record the speed that you push the thing so if you go yeah, fast and then really to. slow yeah it records it that. To. okay that's yeah. even better then because you've you've then essentially got some really interesting shaped envelopes kicking out of that thing it's really good i i, I tend to do this because i use the hermod um by squarp instruments a lot and i use that as a usb device from ableton and what that usually allows me to use is a few of the outputs to essentially just send um modulation information so i might just draw envelope shapes kick that out of an output from Hermod and send that into a filter, for example. Um, it's a little bit of a faff, but this this looks really good that, it, you know, it's there on your app. Is it is it possible to sync it, do we know? Yeah, that's the thing. I don't think there. it is, because I think that would be quite... That's uh, Syncing and triggering would make sense, but it doesn't look like it. It looks like it's really right. that basic. I mean, I'm imagining okay. that... I, I would imagine he's going to sell a boatload of these. Um, yeah. And then probably be able to perform hopefully i mean it, it'll be an update maybe a paid update like an extra 50 cents or another mm. buck or something because you know it's so cheap that you know you buy in and then it's yeah. like, actually this would be you know maybe he's waiting for feedback to see what what yeah. are those features that perhaps he already designed in but took out <laughs> he's going to put back I, in again i think i'd love to see being able to record that information out onto separate lanes inside of a daw so you can capture what it's doing randomly fit it into time in in terms of your actual composition and then you've got it you've got it there forever basically that's That'd an interesting really idea cool. is it is it possible to record in any daw to record like an automation clip and then effectively stretch the length of that rather than edit it so that it it fits do you see what i mean so if you've got a one bar clip or a two beat clip can you either pull it out to loop it or pull it out to stretch yeah. it so that it would last a while? are there any daws that allowed you to do that i can't think of any that do that you obviously oh, yeah, can do it well, with mid ben says yeah go ben all right cheers matthew um it will if you use the expert sleepers devices or any dc coupled sound card so a sound card that doesn't block sub audio rate signals um, so Ableton, Logic, Cubase, I'm sure Pro Tools, you can just record the CV signal. So the workaround, which would be a bit fiddly in terms of modular stuff, would be to MIDI to CV it in the modular and then CV it into an Expert Sleepers device or a More 2 sound card. Oh, so record the audio of the CV effectively. Yeah, there's wow. a great video of um, Cell Dweller, the kind of goth, rocky, electro kind yeah, of Yeah, I did artist. an interview with him a while back, yeah. Yeah, you did. And he, he's recorded some CV from his modular and he's chopping it as if he's like stuttering up beats. And he's like, oh, this little wobble's cool. Let's make this last four bars yeah. and just stretches out the CV. Awesome. So it's not automated, but it looks like audio and it can be chopped and rearranged in the same way. That's a so neat that, idea. Complicated workaround, especially for a 99p app, but um, doable. <laughs> Oh, with yeah. a lot more expensive hardware. I, I suppose the thing, yeah, I, I, yeah, I suppose. But yeah, that's an interesting idea. They'd be able to be able to. I mean, you know, there, there's actually a feature in there, isn't there? Being able to draw CV 
uh, you know, level audio signals. So, you know, in the same way that back right in the early days, you had the pencil that you could edit your samples and the idea was you could de-glitch things. In, 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 pr in practice, it was a nightmare and really hard to do. But if you could just draw simple curves or do something like that, and then that would render it to a CV audio track that you can then stretch or whatever. Yeah, that's an, an edit. That's not a bad idea. Hmm. I Good. suppose you could live MIDI the CC as well as automation, but then, like you said, you're going to have all those little points of movement. It's a bit more fiddly, but if you put, I'm not sure if Ableton does it, but if you put um, all the MIDI and automation, the clip in Logic and hold Alt, you can stretch the information yeah. in the clip. Ah, that's what I was automate. wondering whether you could do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, that's... you just grab the end if you want to make it longer, but hold Alt and it will just stretch everything so that would work as well that's which probably, would just be a midi cable that would be much cheaper <laughs> much more straightforward yeah. and then you could turn it into cv <laughs> yeah. later if you wanted to right okay yeah. Yeah. um but yeah that's uh let me see did i find it? yeah I, I did have a page for it that's this guy uh like i say nebio neboisha Petrovic, I hope I've spelled his name right, uh, pronounced his name right. Uh, 8cc MIDI ribbon pads, uh, example use, yeah, there's lots of it. So it's on the App Store. Um, and we've got a, a show, uh, a, a news item about it, and it just really caught my imagination because I thought that is pretty cool. Right, um, another thing that's pretty cool is, of course, uh, isotoped vocal synth. And, of course, uh, we have a competition that we're running, and we'll tell you a little bit about that in a sec. But what we're actually going to do is uh, tell you about... Isotope Vocal Synth 2, all new design, brand new Biovox module, which models vocal track, human vocal track, massively improved vocoder, CompuVox, TalkBox, more effects, and also reorder all the effects, new GUI, tons and tons of presets that will get you started for doing incredible sort of vocal production stuff, including pitching, time, yeah, lots and lots of stuff. If you want to check it out, go to uh, isotope.com forward slash vocal synth. And of course, we have a winner from last week's competition. We also got the announcement for this week's competition. Last week's winner is somebody called, now if I pronounce this correctly, Bambadam4. So Bambadam4, uh, at, that's our Twitter handle, Bambadam. Uh, and they tweeted, uh, Vocal Synth would be very nice for my vocal production. So uh, if you want to get in touch, we will furnish you with a copy of Vocal Synth, or Isotope will. And of course, we've got another competition this week. We're looking for the hashtag TalkBox and the hashtag Vocal Synth 2 to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inks. So it's a Twitter competition. You need to tweet the hashtag TalkBox, one word, and the hashtag Vocal Synth 2 to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. And uh, we will pick a winner from next week from the entries via our uh, specially developed supercomputer slide slightly manual but uh, random number generator and uh, Twitter search widget anyway um, so let's see what's next ah yeah okay I like this this is uh, on Synthotopia actually and this is uh, a chap called Luis Fernando Zepeda Zepeda uh, and his singing organ which you don't hear just yet <laughs> So it helps that you see the words there because the brain will fill in the gaps. So this was apparently a thing, sort of in the 1960s and 70s, it was a kind of uh, a thing with kind of Spanish uh, organ players, uh, this idea of uh, creating vocal talking. And there's been much speculation about how it was done. I mean, I, I think we know now, but I mean, bearing in mind that I mean, we've heard there's, there's that talking piano, isn't there, which is just basically a massive great bar that turns audio into the spectrum of the 88 key keyboard and just, you know, hits all the notes that correspond to the frequency content of the audio. Whereas this is manipulating the draw bar organ, the organs of the draw bars and the percussive elements to create these things. Now, Rich, I don't know. Whoops. I do beg your pardon. Rich, I don't know if you play the organ or whether you are familiar with the draw bar potential of these things, but. Do you, how do you think it was done? I mean, and have you heard this before? Um, I have uh, heard other kinds of things like this. How do I think it was done? I'm hearing it for the first time as you're playing. Ah, yes, go I put you on it the sounds spot, like it, it sounds like it was processed through somebody's mouth, like like some form of talk box like arrangement, and mm -hmm. that the output of the organ is being fed through somebody's vocal cavity. And that that person is mouthing the words, not unlike Peter Frampton <laughs> did, you know, 50 years later. Um, 
the earliest example of anything like this that I know of is in a Disney cartoon called Clock Cleaners, where the mainspring of this giant clock becomes unwound in some level, and there is all of this sort of uh, formant-filled, mouthed talking that occurs through the sound effect of this spring being unwound. And uh, that's the earliest example I know of somebody sound. I, I still don't know how they did clock cleaners, and this was like 1932 or something. Right. But um, I think that the most obvious way to do this is to put the sound into somebody's mouth and let them do it. And back then, I think that would have probably been the most uh, reasonable way. And it was the most reasonable way until the, the invention of vocoders, which may have occurred when Wendy Carlos had to do Beethoven's Ninth for Clockwork Orange and modified a 10-band fixed filter bank in her um, modular Moog to output 10 channels and basically built a vocoder out of modules. Ah, okay. And use that. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I have, I mean, somebody was saying in the comments, I think, uh, let me see if I've got it. Uh, there's a chap called Alfredo Garza Hernandez in the comments. Said the technique was invented at, uh, and it was used, this is apparently at Hammond X66, because on some Hammonds, you can preset the draw bar settings on the bottom octave and use those to switch between. Um, and some people are saying that what you could do is if because when you're listening to the stuff play there's only the bass part and the one hand there's not as usual you get with a dual manual organ you get two organ parts plus the bass part so one hand is doing something else so there's speculation that what's going on is they're switching the draw bars of one of the manuals in a very skillful and articulate way i don't know whether that's the case or not um let's see i don't know give Ben, did you did you see this? I mean, it's it's quite old school, and but it's just the, it, it's a testament to the sort of genius of what. How can I make this sound like that? And it may well be, as Rich said, like a talk box thing, but it may be you know another another way it was done as well. Yeah, I, I did see. I really enjoyed it. I just imagine this organ player, you know, mouthing all these vowels and singing along. Um, yeah, you're right. The comments on the Symphotopia post, um, Alfredo um, Hernandez talks about it's a 60s and 70s uh, Mexico City thing that was invented by uh, Juan Torres and then kind of perfected by this performer that you shared the video of. Um, he's also blind. Mm. He said he's a blind organ player. And records used to be sold um, as um, the organ that talks. And he actually lists the drawbar settings for each of the vowels. Um, oh, wow. And I was just thinking how, fran how frantic it would be with each finger, but I didn't realise that that organ you could preset drawbar settings which would make far more sense to select a vowel in the left and you know play in the right yeah really impressive um, wh whichever way it is even if it's preset vowel sounds on the keys it's still it's an expressive form of playing an organ absolutely um, yeah yeah yeah, Matt, I don't know whether or not uh, something you've come across. I mean, do you, uh, we've, we do talk about vocoders quite a lot because famously Dave Spears' uh, other half just really has... She, or not, <laughs> she's not phobic about them, but she really doesn't <laughs> like them. There's something about them that she really doesn't like, so I imagine she perhaps wouldn't like this particular track, even though there's that lovely cheesy lounge music kind of bossing over vibe to it, which she may respond to. Yeah, I, I love vocoders, actually. My, I've been through quite a few of them as well. I've had the, the core... Uh, you know, the old school Korg one, but my favorite one, it's just sat over there, is the Korg, I don't know if you've come across this, the Korg DVP-1, digital voice processor. I've heard it's, about it, it. Let's see if I can find an does, image. It does vocoding and it does harmonizing um, and it's got inbuilt synthesis into it. And it's some of the sounds you can get out of it isn't too dissimilar to this. It's quite, it's very synthetic. That's the one. Yeah, so that's that's the one I use. I used that on one of my very first EPs back in the day. And um yeah, I absolutely love it. It's sound um and you can you can pro it's quite in depth in terms of programming. It's digital, of course, but um yeah, you should check that one out. That's quite interesting. You can you can definitely get sounds like this this guy's pulling out here, but what an incredible sound, eh? Yeah, good fun. Jolly good fun. Um, anyway, that was that was just a really sort of, uh, one, I wonder how it was done because there seemed to be a lot of speculation. But we think the consensus, certainly in the comments, is it's using preset uh, preset key. And it must be enhanced by maybe switching in and out the percussive elements of the of the sound as well to give things a bit more a bit more bite or, you know, whatever, 
glottal stops and all of that sort of thing. But yeah, great piece. And if you want to check out this, Symptopia, as I'm sure anybody who, watch it, who uh, watches or listens to this show is familiar with their site and they always have some good stuff. And I'm often raiding it for topics for the, uh, for the, the podcast. And this week is no different. Uh, so, uh, well, we talked about applications a little bit earlier, and um, I don't know if you saw this. This is a, another uh, uh, sort of quite disturbing piece of news in many ways, although I guess it's one of the things that uh, is inevitable in this world of uh, large uh, as, as things become more uh, conglomerated and, uh, and, and, and amalgamated. Apple uh, have announced that they're going to be stopping affiliate uh, uh, payments or affiliate sales uh, via iOS and Mac apps on October the 1st, uh, which in itself is just think, yeah, so what? But actually, it's quite a big deal because there's there are three strings to this. The first part is many um, developers market their own product and they will create a website, do videos like this chap had that we spoke about, uh, Ribbon, and then link it to an affiliate site so they get they get back some of the 30 percent they lose from apple uh, or they they give to apple in terms of hosting it for hosting it on the itunes store which you know is just an extra thing but there are also quite a lot of sites i mean tim webb's discord who's been on this show not for a long time but he has been uh, in the past uh, that's you know that's like 50 percent of his revenue uh, peter kern in this article he says you know part of the site is about ios apps and uh, that's self-funding you know it generates revenue i mean small amounts of revenue but it helps finance the person who writes that area of the site i mean all of these things are going to go away um, and not only that but Apple are now hiring their own editorial people to kind of like help discovery because I mean let's face it, the iTunes store is an absolute nightmare for discovering anything I mean the only way you generally find out about it is probably through things like this or our site or various other people's site that sort of say this is a really cool app so this is this is uh, this is a bit of a drag because it's again it's just the sort of the the, the the jackboot of capitalism crushing the, uh, the the independent publisher, saying thanks very much for helping us make the uh, make the, uh, the the audio ecosystem what it was, but uh, we don't have no use for you anymore. Maybe I'm being a little bit extreme there, but you know I'm paraphrasing for effect, really. I know Ben. I'm I'm guessing. Uh, oh, that's not Ben. Uh, I'm guessing. You know. I don't know whether or not you've done had to do any of the affiliate side of things. I mean, these things that you know they're never going to make you rich, but they certainly help soften the load a little bit sometimes. Yeah, I, I think it's an important thing. I mean, certainly not my channel and not many music tech YouTube channels that I know, but many make quite a bit of their income on like Amazon affiliates, you know, getting a kickback, getting five to 10% if someone goes and buys something you've suggested. Or it's a big thing. It's like the kind of background royalty stream for smaller artists. Um, and to pull that out from under people um, is really going to damage a lot, I think. And as well, the the weird feeling I got with Apple is how that from kind of the iPhone three, I think, to about six or seven, and um, there seemed to be a lot of and you don't hear much of this anymore. Them sweeping up features from the top selling app that year into the next iPhone, you know, something that was a, a 99p app two years ago that sold great and was the number one in that uh, category, then becomes a feature. And I don't know whether they're buying up these companies and buying their intellectual property or they just keep kind of being brushed away um, and features and intellectual property just being soaked up. It's a grey area that I know very little about, but the affiliate thing, certainly. You know, all these income streams that people need, and I imagine there's some comparison between indie app developers and artists. Um, yeah. I think the damage a lot, definitely. That's the feeling yeah. I got. It is. I mean, and the other thing, I mean, in this in this this age, you know, it's no longer, uh, you know, you can't make generally a, a, a viable living off one idea or one stream of it. You know, you have to kind of multitask and come up with lots of different little ways that add up to something a great bigger. And this is eating up, you know, certainly for some sites, a lot of uh, that extra stuff. Um, I don't know, Rich. I mean, I know, you know, it, it's an inevitability, isn't it? It's just the way things are. But it just sort of feels somehow a bit mean spirited and kind of um, not particularly rewarding people who've because I think, and I've said it before, I think iOS and the whole Apple ecosystem has really been bootstrapped up on the development of audio and all these sorts of applications. They really did kind of uh, make the App Store what it was in the beginning, I think. Oh, I can't dispute any of that. And I, of course, uh, bemoan the fact that independent developers are now going to, if I understand correctly, now have to market their products strictly through Apple and not on their own. Is that the case? 
I believe that's also sort of like that. So that presumably they might actually end up having to pay Apple additional marketing fees. I mean, we don't know that yet. The details are a bit loose. But the point is that they're prohibited from selling it as, as a third party uh, offering. Is that right. what well, I understand? They, that says? They, can't, they can't get a kickback from the click through. If they market it successfully on you know, a website or whatever, the click through, I mean, they'll still get the sale potentially. So they'll get that, but they won't get that right. extra little. I think it used to be oh, 7%, seven, seven and it probably dropped to a smaller percentage. But all that adds up if you've got a successful okay. app. Yeah, I understand. I wonder what their reasons for doing that are. I mean, it's not atypical for them to do things like that, but I just wonder what their reasoning is. Well, maybe they this. need to make the company worth $2 trillion now rather than just a mere trillion yeah, well, dollars. Yeah. <laughs> there is that. But they must have a reasoning. I, I, we, we might not like it or agree with it, but they've got – there's something driving this. And uh, Yeah, no, maybe you're right. Because it can't just be preventing other people from making money. There's got to be some, some issue for them, whether it's – like in most – usually their excuse is consistency, that by – limiting the ability of anybody outside the company to do this that it gives us more consistency within this product and uh that sort of thing and i just wonder what their excuse is in this case. yeah well maybe maybe, maybe some it's... chatties will have an idea yeah no, that's <laughs> a good point i i mean there usually is another reason and it may it may just be you know down to to revenue but i suppose the thing is also it's I mean, for, certainly for publishers like us who, you know, do rely on a, the, the native web to a degree, you know, the idea of bringing all this stuff in-house. So, you, you know, Facebook is, has eaten a lot of the native web's traffic because people view things via Facebook, same with Instagram, same. And I guess, you know, maybe that's sort of something that's being tried, you know, also sucking into the app ecosystem. So effectively you're serving web content, but via an app, it then becomes through the Apple ecosystem. And that's... That's difficult for independency, I suppose. I don't know, Matt, I'll come to you. Have you do you have any wise words? Oh, I don't know too much about this. I, I know some people are doing very well from affiliate links from uh, from various bits and bobs. I'm just trying to see what the advantage is here for the for the consumer. I mean, we go to the these sites and we, we check it, you know, that are really good at showing discounts, showing updates, um, because like you said, the Apple Store is just a nightmare to go through. So it affects that. Uh, and then revenue coming from that. And for developers as well, I mean, there's only a few people who get a push on the App Store if they've got, um, you know, if they've got a decent app up there, there's only a few that are going to get them highlighted up yeah. there. I, I just don't see, um, the only people that this is going to work for is Apple isn't it but then again or maybe not because if the, if the market not, if, if these driving. products don't then you know if these products then don't get made or if this this guy you know I mean, they're, they're resulting on people to make content to promote their own content but they're not they're stopping them from getting any kickbacks which i i, I could understand maybe closing that loophole if you're a publisher you can't be an affiliate maybe you know i could understand maybe because you're getting that's the royalty split you're getting and the marketing the marketing affiliate click, it should go to third parties. I mean, I suppose that's almost justifiable, but just shutting it down just for that. You, I'm sure you could figure out how to do that without having to go to take this broad sweep. But yeah, maybe that's it. Yeah, you'd think so. I, I don't, I wish I understand understood it a little bit more, to be honest. Because um, like you say, the, you can't just have one string to your bow these days if you're trying to get an idea off the ground. One of the things, we're, all, we're always trying to tell this to the students as well, that they've got an idea, we look at, how to develop those kind of things and look at potential revenues, particularly contemporary revenues and affiliate links and selling is certainly something that's reasonably new. And, and some people can do very well from it. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it, it's a shame, isn't it? It's a shame we don't quite understand it, uh, but I guess all will be revealed. Yeah, that's maybe I so. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not an altruistic move. You know, it's not philanthropic necessarily. Anyway, let's move on to something completely different. And now uh, this is, uh, this, this may have turned me, and I think you might understand what I'm saying when you hear it, right. So this is, I'm sorry for the highly compressed audio. This is uh, Japanese artist Saito, who's a uh, chiptune artist. And this is all done with the chiptune style. It's very... <laughs> but 
I mean, the complexity of it is amazing and the energy is amazing. I, I, it's perhaps not the best uh, platform. I, I listened to it on uh, computer speakers earlier and I thought it sounded better than listening to just a straight chip tune recording because there's something about all the aliasing gets a bit harsh, whereas that's harsh for different reasons. And certainly in my headphones, that didn't sound that great. But uh, that's his cover of Thriller. And it's a really full, I mean, it goes all the way through and then right towards the end, he's got, I, I'll see if I can play it. I'll just see if I can find this because if I can do that, There we go, he goes to the end. Oh. What's really brilliant is the way that he's using these the, the limitations of the chiptune stuff to create some of these uh, these things. One of them is the, mo the that, that kind of square wave modulation, which is using loads. The intervals between them, he's shifting those so that it sounds like chords going up and down and I just thought that was absolutely genius and it, it, it kind of comes back to the limitation but I, I, I for one have had I've got a real problem with chip tunes I've never really liked it because it reminds me of those really crummy birthday cards with the little tunes in and the speakers and, and that is always or digital watch tones you know that's the, and I, I find it really offensive and I can't really explain why uh, I, I guess I, put, I wrote in the article like, perhaps it's some therapy I need some exposure therapy so maybe something happened to me in my childhood and that that's the reason I can't appreciate chip stones so I don't know if anyone's into chip tunes and perhaps could sell me the concept a bit better than uh, that oh. already happened I know Ben I'm coming to you because modular can make chip tuney type sounds I mean there are chip tune modules yeah. aren't there even yeah 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 there's things like the um, ALM SID guts that use the original SID chips um you know, there's all sorts of new old stock chips, be it, I know chip tune isn't DX7s, but old DX Yamaha chips that have sat unused in a factory and someone will get a batch and make a hundred modules. And yeah, you can do it. And I, I don't know, that video is great. I'm not a massive chip tune fan, but I agree. Like you said, all the kind of top end aliasing you would get from a direct recording is gone and you're then presented with the harsh upper mids that you get by just holding your phone up in an audience. So it doesn't sound great, but the energy is fantastic. Yeah. Um, I think there's some non chip tune sounds in there. There's kind of a little poly synth thing going on that I thought, oh, that's a bit. That, are you that's sure not that's not that? Are you sure that's not the square wave modulation thing? Because that's what I noticed as well. But I thought. It sounds like a really airy, breathy pad that sounds a bit too. I don't know, Casio CZ ish, maybe. It's hard to tell, know, to be fair. But yeah, I'll take your point. But yeah, it, it, it's those. It is that fast square thing that is obviously the novel. You know, it's like an arpeggiator running really fast, so that a mono voice can give the impression of a chord. Um, and it's no, it's novel for a track or two for me, and then I, I I wouldn't want an album of it particularly. But yeah, I, I really enjoyed this video. Um, Chip tunes, not something I've tried to make. I do like all the drum sounds that you used to get on Ataris and things as well, and you, you know, just having noise. And it's some kind of eight bit crushed noise mm. for a snare, and that's it. Uh, mixing those with real sounds or layering them with modular stuff is great. Yeah, they just, everything just needs of... a low pass filter, doesn't it, really, to try to take the aliasing out of it? <laughs> yeah, I love that just harsh on and off of everything. And being able to then sculpt that, I think, is very useful. But I've never actually tried to just out and out make chip tune or even just working within those restrictions it might be interesting to look at what a certain device like and whatever was in the atari had and think right that's all i will use that many voices and only so many of them at once um it could be interesting yeah and i think that's and why perhaps pe people are so evangelical about it because especially people who make it because they perhaps perhaps appreciate the creative limitations of it and kind of go isn't it amazing but you know sometimes the the, the work that goes into art doesn't always make the art particularly appealing, but I just thought this was a great yeah. piece of energy. I, I, Rich, I appreciate you may not have had much time to fully appreciate the the full arrangement of this tune, being that you were in transit, but uh, chip tunes, how do you feel about them generally? I'm not even sure what we're talking about, but I enjoyed what I just heard. <laughs> um, well, the chip <coughs> tunes, chip in other tunes words, thing this whole chip tunes thing is, I'm not sure, but I like what I just saw. It was in, it was energetic, as Ben said, and uh, it was fun. 
Yeah, good energy. I mean, chip tunes generally. I mean, it's it sort of started out with uh, things like Commodore C sixty four, Nintendo uh, games, where you just had very basic voice architecture, and also there, like you say, there's some old Yamaha, uh, not FM chips, but Yamaha GM chips or Yamaha sound devices that I think they used to go in sound blasters and stuff like that. I, I, I am, I, I'm not, I don't confess to be an expert, but I think that's part. Well, of I've it. seen. Rooms full of old hard drives whirring at different pitches that yeah. guys were controlling and making music with and crazy things like that. I mean, it's all very Nickelodeon-ish kind of uh, mechanical musical instrument kind of, you know, with electronics as an interface kind of stuff. It's fun. It's interesting. It's creative and it's cool and it's novelty. It falls into the realm of novelty to me. Yeah. Well, this guy's side And I don't mean that is in any kind of derogatory way because yeah. I love it, and especially as it relates to mechanical musical instruments. But it falls to me under the generalized umbrella of novelty, fun stuff. Yeah, I can take that. I mean, Cytone has made like three albums over the last uh, 10 years or so of chiptune stuff. I mean, I don't know if I could listen to the whole thing because it's just that harshness to it. But it, it's, it's, it's a bit like making a model of the Royal Albert Hall with matchsticks, isn't it? It's kind of got that same sort of, sort of uh, this is going to be really hard, but I'm going to do it. You know? uh, I think for us, like, as you know, as music technologists, music producers, we can really appreciate the amount of time that's gone into programming something like this particularly so well as that clip you just played. It's it's really, really good. But um, even when I was young and I, you know, I was playing Nintendo, uh, Mario, Sonic the Hedgehog, and you're listening to all the kind of music that's coming out there, Atari ST, Amiga. Even then, you know, at such a young age, I was quite drawn to this music and I, I thought it was really quite interesting. But I, ne I never quite, I never questioned it at the time. I never thought, why does this music sound so bit crushed I, you know i didn't understand that they only had so much memory to play with and and this that and the other and that there was some very very skilled engineers and or, uh, composers behind this music having to work with such minimal information in order to make something work um and they did make it work back in the day didn't they because we can all remember kind of uh, super mario and um castlevania and all these kind of main theme tunes for those those great games when we were younger um but i'm big in i love reverbs and i love delays and they're <laughs> really hard to do um <laughs> you know in this world so i'm you know you know 80 percent of my sound is delays and reverbs and that kind of thing so i'm always always looking for that but i suppose if i was out and i was at that club and that that guy was doing his michael jackson there i'd be yeah i'd yeah i'd buy him a beer Definitely. <laughs> Excellent. I think in context of some other sounds as well, you know, if that was part of a set and then it went a bit chip tune, it would have really yes. gone off. It sounds like a lot of energy in the room. If it was an hour of that, my I wouldn't be into it particularly. I think yeah. the modern equivalent, and it's come up a lot in the YouTube chat, is the pocket operators. Yeah. Because um, they have that similar voice restriction of, you know, it's four voice polyphonic, which if you've got three drums playing and two synths, one of them's going to cancel the other out. And it's a similar experience, I think. But there's a lot more than a pocket operator going on on stage to do all that. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> uh, well, this is an aside, and this isn't in the topic list, but it reminds me a little bit of uh, the la just yesterday, wasn't it? The uh, the latest AFX twin uh, video has came out. I yes. think it's called T69 Collapse. And uh, the big news story about it, I mean, he's had this amazing teaser campaign, these beautiful posters that have been sort of put up on interesting backgrounds that sort of morph out of it. The whole video is done in like old video toaster style with kind of Minecraft style blocky stuff, almost chips tunes. And some of the sound sources he's used in the video are very old school drum machines, uh, old school kind of digital instruments and, and that side of things. Um, but I feel much the same way about his stuff as I do about chip tunes. It just sort of doesn't, it's never really clicked with me. But it's an, it's, it, there's obviously a lot of skill that's gone into making that. And the T69 Collapse, you know, it's probably going to sell loads. There's a new EP coming out. I think it's called Collapse. But it, it has a sort of parallel for me. I mean, I don't, does anybody get Aphex Twin? I mean, you know, it's not like he's a kid and I've only, I've only, I just don't understand kids' music because he's been around for as long as I've been making music, but I've never really kind of clicked with it. Is there anything that, that should I, is there some more listening I should yeah. try and uh, try and uh, check out, Matt? Yeah. Um, um, I love his early stuff, the Richard DJ stuff. And uh, his Ambient, have you heard the Ambient album that he did? 
No, I, that's probably more my my uh, cup of tea. Check that one out. That one's that one's classic, sort of heavily compressed 808s with lots of cheap reverbs and um, yeah, chilled out bass lines and things like that. It's a lot less erratic. Um, Richard D. James, yeah, Aphex Twin. I, when I was growing up and I was at university, I was obsessed with finding out as much information as possible on this guy. You know how how he programming stuff. The same with Orteca and those sort of people. Um, you know, I was I would spend ages trawling the net trying to find out things. Fortunately enough, I now work with a guy who who's good friends with them all, and he just tells me exactly what they do and what what technologies they're using and what drum machines and all this kind of thing. Um, and it's it, it goes back to this kind of um, ethos that I have, which is about taking something like a very basic uh, DR Boss drum programmable machine drum thing, and then misusing it in ways and and um, programming it in in ways that was unexpected, really. To achieve those sort of results yeah i suppose so i wonder if he's using the actual original step programming on those drum machines or triggering them over midi or sampling them and doing, doing them in but i don't all, know as far as i'm aware it's it's all internal um uh, i've got a list of the the dr main drum machines that he uses and there's there's some particular functions where you're you're able to access a couple of parameters by holding down this combination and, and this parameter will appear, which allows you to do the kind of stuttering triplet. It's the, a window allows you to open to, um, yeah, to get to the way that you're not just adding, you know, suddenly going to 96 or 16th beat repeats, that kind of thing. But in fact, you're able to play back the samples and, and stutter within that. I've got it all written down somewhere. I'm, I need to have a go. Yeah, it's okay. really interesting stuff. The um the guy oh, yeah, I worked I with Alex. Sorry. He, he yeah, sorry, I've got yeah, I'll try and get some more information. Maybe I can tell you on, on the next show. But um Alex, who I work with, he he's actually got one of the old computers that Ortec made one of their albums on. And um yeah, he's good pals with them. A lot of Nord, I think, with those guys. A lot of the Nord programming, if you're familiar with those, little micro modulars. Yeah, the G two and, and that sort of stuff. G twos and all that that's a lot of Vortec are getting to that world as well as Max and Pure Data as well. As well. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Sorry, Ben, you were going to come in there. Yeah, I, I was going to kind of reconfirm what, what Matthew had said about the selected ambient works, volume one and two. I think you'd very much be into Nick. Like, like Matthew said, it's got that kind of Elisis MIDI verb, kind of cheap 90s reverb splashed all over it through compression and a lot of great pieces. Um, for me, the Aphex Twin was my old guitar teacher. Um, at school showing me come to daddy and the video for it and having to do a recording for a, a school music performance and trying to learn to play the drums to come to daddy from afx twin which <laughs> i've still got a recording of that's not that far off i was without any kind of ego to it i was fairly accomplished when i was just completely in that headspace for drums from being a kid so it's quite, in, I mean, it's terrible looking back, but it's not bad for a school kid trying to play Aphex Twin on a drum kit. Yeah, well, good <laughs> um, for you. And yeah, yeah, it kind of caught me off guard because I was, I was playing a lot of kind of rock and some heavier stuff and it had that edge to it. You know, there was no like dubstep at the time, which I guess if I was a kid, you know, fast forward 10, 15, 20 years or whatever, dubstep would have probably caught my attention at the time as a 15 year old. Um, you know, Jungle was still very much reggae rhythms and, and tight programmed AMM breaks. So Aphex Twin really jumped out as something electronic that, I don't know, just kind of heavy electronic thing that wasn't just club music. Yeah, um, I suppose There's a lot true. of interesting stuff, I think. Um, you should check out a jazz trio called The Bad Plus playing a version of um, Flim, which is a really nice piano piece. Um there's some really good music hidden in there, but there's a lot that if you're not into it, it would take some finding. Definitely. Right. Okay. Well, thanks for that. I will try that first album. I don't know, Rich, whether uh, the Aphex Twin release has uh, come up on your radar. I don't know how big it is. In, I mean, it's pretty massive globally. It's interesting because he's such an enigma. I mean, nobody really knows who. I mean, there are lots of people who know who he is and know, you know, have bought synths off him or, you know, you get to sort of, but well, I, I don't know. Now I feel like I'm in good company when you say that. Because <laughs> I don't know who he is. You just said nobody knows who he is. I'm thinking good because I'm in yeah, good company. Yeah, fair enough. 
Um, well, and not because I would, I, and, and I feel silly for being ignorant, but I honestly don't know any, anything about his music. So I'm sure he's a wonderful person who makes magnificent stuff, although I have a friend online here who might differ. But, uh, you know. Yeah, I each to their to own. I'm, I'm, I'm looking, I, I, again, I just threw that one in there, so nobody would, you know, it was, there was no uh, other agenda. I just noticed that it came out yesterday. Uh, or, or was, no, it's coming out in September sometime, I think. Let's take a look at um, at this now. This is another, uh, uh, if we've got time, what's the time? Oh, 57, let's quickly. Did you see this, uh, Dennis Fish? That's not working as I expected. Is that coming out? I can't tell if it is or not. Yep, you hear that. It's also coming out of my speakers, which it shouldn't be. Anyway, this is uh, Waveform Research Centre. This was... Uh, uh, Oh, Dennis Vershaw in his amazing studio, which is uh, WRC Worm, which is in Rotterdam. It just seems to be full of awesome old 50s and 60s test equipment. And there's an interview. Uh, I'll if I won't post the whole thing. I just thought, I, I mean, everybody, I mean, most people have had a little bit of experience. Maybe they know someone who's got one of those type of units that might be a filter that's their magic bullet or, you know, an oscillator. I know that, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the guy, Atomic Shadow, who's got like a, a tape-based uh, studio with lots of those sort of 50s oscillators in it. And I know that a lot of those sort of oscillators were used in early uh, early electronic music like Stockhausen and whatnot. Uh, and also, uh, I think Zappa used to use kind of things like that, like oscillators for various different sound effects and things. But this is the studio in... Uh, it's called Worm, uh, and these are the spaces, and it's just a another example of these amazing spaces that seem to have in Holland, uh, where electronic music and synthesizer production is actually quite disproportionately high, you'd think. Uh, certainly in Utrecht, there's Kytopia, there's this in, uh, and, and lots of other things going on. I know, Rich, have you ever been to that sort of electronic music studio where there are those sort of things? Because I've, I've only seen a few of those kind of devices, like they're the old RCA oscillators, and I think um, B and H, B, B, no B and K, B and Kaya, who made went on to make uh, really well-known omnidirectional studio microphones, which are really sought after during a particular time. Have I ever? Uh, not those in particular, and not in that country. However, um, I was. I think I've mentioned this before. Privileged to work in a room with Moog Modular Number Three at Cornell University uh, for a semester, and. As romantic as that sounds, Moog Modular Number Three was not in working condition at the time, so I wasn't actually using it, but it was sitting right there. Um, and further, I uh, used to gig on Mini Moog Number Eighty Nine, which belonged to an original member of the Moog Trio from the nineteen nice. sixties, um, and he was my music history teacher and was kind enough to lend me his Mini Moog to gig on. And boy, did that thing sound great! Um, so I've been around early synthesizers and I've been in rooms and around people who create live music like that because also in Ithaca, because the synthesizer industry kind of blossomed there to some extent, some part of it did. Uh, there was a group called Mother Mallard's Portable Masterpiece Company led by a gentleman named David Borden. And it was a trio that performed live on modular synthesizer rigs that would built right up the road at Moog's house in Trumansburg. And um, I used to see them play at the time. And I saw Robert Moog speak at Cornell University in 1975 for the first time. So uh, those are my those are my memories of that. Oh, and also at Albany, in, uh, up in State University of New York at Albany, they had a modular Moog that was the size of like five large American refrigerators standing next to each other. Wow, and, nice. Uh, I, was in, I was in that room as well because a friend of mine was studying there. And I once made it to the New England School of Electronic Music, which had a whole lot of stuff, including ARP 2500s and all that sort of New Englandy stuff that was uh, going on over there. And I was in there once because a friend of mine studied there. Um, so I've been around a bunch of these places for a long, long time, going back many years. Yeah, this uh, worm worm looks like they've got a pretty nice uh, large large format twenty five hundred there as well. Yeah, um, but I've yeah, never I like I said, I've, I've never really had a chance to play with it. I remember um, there was a golf rap remix that we did, and it, uh, I think it might be a, it was some I think it might have been B and K, and it's a, or a Sennheiser, and it was a very high Q analog filter which had a dial like this big with a kind of lots of lots and lots of 
titles on it and you turn so we've got these kind of really slow high q filter sweeps which were really interesting i don't know um, i i guess um matt you're an educator have they got any of that kind of stuff in your uh, secret electronics room at the uh, uh -huh. at bim we we do have a room um which i've done a few from a few shows ago where we've got the moog in there and we've got um synthesizers and outboard kit and that kind of thing a room to kind of go in and experiment and just have a go and plug stuff in with pedals uh and outboard gear and 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 expand beyond working with a daw perhaps um i i was inspired to to get that room up off the ground having gone to the university of west london um where i was taught and i studied and got my ma in degree there in audio technology and i'd spent a lot of time in studio four in ealing film studios and in there we had a room with a system 100 in it vcs3 some of the rack mount dx7s um an rs uh, modular synthesizer kurtz files nords and that kind of thing and i would pretty much just go in there and and use them without switching on the computer as much as possible or only just turning on the computer to use that as a tape machine and um, just to just to kind of approach music production from another angle as we was getting taught a lot of the time about pro tools and tape machines and, sure. and using computers and i was very much drawn to this this one particular room that just had all this old gear in that no one else would book out and i would just i'd just go in there and use it a lot i bet you can't get in there anymore Unfortunately, I bet, not. Out. I bet it's booked out now. Yeah, uh, this is really. <laughs> I mean, the, you know, the, you look at the background of some of these. Things, I mean, the, you know, just the amount of heat no. that these things must generate. Yeah, uh, right. I know. I just can't believe it. I mean, it's it, all of this stuff. It's just. I mean, they're all valve-based things. I mean, those look like individual oscillators. Yeah, and it's just I there's mean, just tons and tons also, and tons of it. Can you imagine trying to do a live set with this and take it all out with you? <laughs> no, <laughs> it would be impossible. You know? You're not going to take that to a, to a pub, are you? Bring the audience to you. Yeah. I don't know. That's yeah. what I do, Ben. I, have you ever hankered after, you know, because the, these things do come up from time to time. You see them on Vimeo. You see them in certain synth auctions. And they must be, you know, hard things to find and, uh, you know, to, to maintain, I'd imagine. Yeah. I mean, I get the appeal of it. it you know, have, if I had access to a room like that, it'd be great. You know, going with an audio recorder, capture a load of sounds, play around, maybe be inspired by the gear. and But, I don't know. It seems like more hassle than it's worth. <laughs> I have an old oscilloscope that is fine for looking at, like the intro of that video, just some nice green glowing waves, but it's not calibrated or anything we need properly looking at to keep it running as a test equipment, effectively. Um, things beyond that, you know, like Ma Matthew said about having at the West London University, I had access to a pair of ECS frees from EMS. Um, at university that very much appealed um, and would be a case of, like Matt said, just going in there, hitting record on a computer and just playing and learning and being inspired and going away and meticulously sitting and chopping on the MacBook that I had at the time. Um, I find it inspiring in a way, but I think that's just a bit too far away from modern synthesis for me. You know, a signal generator, not an oscillator, just a <laughs> signal generator. <laughs> Yeah, it goes um, from it goes from DC up to VHF, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. From sub to supersonic, and and on on one dial that you're just going round and round on. Um, and yeah, the, you know, the beauty of all the instability and things is great, but I think it, for me it needs to come a bit more forward than that into the more modulars, the EMS gear, the System 100 and 100M as well. Um, I'd like to go for an afternoon. And maybe I'd then really want to go back. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, it'd be it'd be fun. Okay. Well, I just wanted to throw that in there. But uh, um, that's it. We've got through all our topics this week. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Rich, for joining us from your uh, your hotel near the racetrack. I hope you get to go out in a high powered sports vehicle and do a couple of laps. That would be great fun, I'd imagine. But uh, I don't know if you've got time. When's your next gig? Tomorrow. Ah, tomorrow. So you just got the rest of the day to. To hang out. Mm -hmm. Well, but, but thank very you. much enjoyed doing the show. Thank you for having. Yeah, me. and thank you for having us. Thank you for letting us be part of your day as well. I know that it's a it's a busy schedule. Um, and uh, when are you back home? Um, the twentieth of this month for 
a brief period. All ah, right, so it's <laughs> right in the middle of it. Okay. Uh, there's more. There's more. I'll be back. I'll be back. Well, Rich, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, also, uh, Mr. Matthew Hodson, thank you for joining us too. Don't forget, uh, Matt's thank got a uh, live stream. If you go to his channel, just search out Matthew Hodson on YouTube and he'll thank be you. streaming live sometime soon, I'd imagine. Yeah, as soon as we're off air, I'll turn around and turn this on, I think. Excellent. See well, do that. I encourage you all to go and uh, check it out. Thanks very much for joining us, Matt. Yes. And also, uh, Mr. Ben Wilson, okay, Div Kid, thanks for joining us too. I know you've got a lot of videos to do and a uh, busy guy. And um, yes, p check out Ben's channel on YouTube as well. Is it Div Kid Video on YouTube? It is, yeah. And just to get a cheeky plug in that's relevant for this weekend, we've got the Modular Meets Leeds event in Leeds, um, which if you just put modular meets Leeds, you'll find it on the internet. Um, modular and non-modular gear, you know, big community showcase, manufacturers, users, performances, big gear raffle, raffle. I think and all the money from the raffle goes to charity, so I don't feel bad pushing this, but I think we've the biggest raffle to win synth gear in existence, or at least modular gear. Nice. Maybe that's a big claim. That's um, a good one. Yeah. Is Come it and give a bit of money to a is it the same venue? Because we went and did it one year, and it was great. I had a really nice weekend. I would love to have come up, but I'm, this weekend I'm doing some more theatre uh, theatre sound, which uh, I did last weekend, and I'm doing some more this weekend, so I couldn't possibly make it. But I would love to. I'm there in spirit. Yeah, I should say, people you know, put Modular Meets Leeds in the Sonic State page. Um, there's some great performances and interviews that you did as well with the artist from a couple of years ago. Uh, same venue, um, now Good. with uh, DB Dubs in the room as well so with what sorry one of the best artists, uh, some db subs on the ah. pa rig as well so one of the best if not the best sounding venues in leeds yeah i can um, i mean even back then before they were in i remember the room was shaking so that's going to be uh, particularly with electronic i mean if you haven't heard electronic music amplified properly with a nice pa system it's a really <laughs> It's kind of almost a life-changing experience, so it's worth going just for that, even even if nothing else. Yeah, well, well, credit to Phil Hall, that's Blue Wolf Seven, who played. There's a video of him playing on your page that's from right, the yeah. event. He installed that rig, and you know, goes off touring with bands. But the clarity, and not just Kane in the PA system, it's not mega loud, but you feel it. You know, great rig, good engineer, some good performers. It is a, a change in. Really motivating thing I find these events. Um, any other kind of synth events, I come back with a lot of energy from this kind of thing. It's great. Yeah, well, have a great weekend, Ben. And thank you very much, everybody, for joining us as well this weekend. Just want to quickly uh, plug the Isotope competition before we go. Uh, vocal Synth 2, if you want to win a copy of uh, Isotope's excellent vocal processing uh, system, uh, we're looking for the hashtag TalkBox, one word, and the hashtag Vocal Synth 2 to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. Uh, that's the hashtag TalkBox and the hashtag Vocal Synth 2 to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. And if you enter, you'll win, uh, you, can, you have a chance to win a copy for next week. That's that's it for this time. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll see you all um, next Wednesday. That's it. Thank you very much for watching. See you next time.